Thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank you to County Executive Singer for his leadership in the revitalization of the county, for his focus on North County and his engagement in issues that are so important to our region at this particular time in our journey. I do want to give a special recognition to Mike Downing and to Sally Hemingway from the Missouri Department of Economic Development. They've been extraordinary partners in this journey over the last year. Their support, their engagement, their advice, their direct participation in our working groups has really been an example of extraordinary partnership. So to Mike and to Sally and to your entire teams, I am very grateful. And I want to commend you for being here. You know, this is time out of your schedule. You all have day jobs and things that are pressing back home. Yet you've chosen to be here. And you've chosen to take this time to step back and to think about how I can be better, how we can grow my particular area, and how we can partner with others to make great things happen for the citizens of Missouri. I've been blessed to have two careers and uh, kind of on my way to, to life three. I spent 20 years in public policy in Illinois and Missouri, mostly in governor's offices, and then had a 20-year corporate life uh, with United Van Lines and Mayflower Transit as the CEO of Unigroup, a $1.7 billion company headquartered here in St. Louis. And those experiences have, I think, informed a lot of the way I think about the world but I actually am, am grateful to have this invitation because um, I frequently have people scratch their heads when they think, should we invite Rich to speak? Because if you may have noticed from my bio or if you've been on Google, uh, one of the sordid parts of my career is I had a little stint on reality TV. I don't know whether you've seen the show Undercover Boss, but in 2011, season two, I went undercover for United Van Lines, and people scratched their heads when they saw how poorly I did the most basic tasks required of our employees and our contractors. Loading trucks, packing goods, working in a warehouse. What saved the show was the first time that the undercover boss producers had invited a spouse to be on the show, and so Sharon and I actually did the show together. She worked one of the jobs with me, and the show focused a bit on the partnership of our marriage of some 37 years, but I did say that. I really should have been fired. I was terrible at most of the jobs that, that I did. What I want to do today is take just a little bit of time and, uh, like any uh, good speaker, just signpost three points that I would say to you in an elevator if I were telling you what I was going to talk about. The first is that in the midst of all of the news and all of the noise level, it's important to step back and keep perspective. And that is to promote and learn from the strengths of your area as we are promoting and learning of the strengths of our area. Secondly, to confront reality in that process and realize that there are many things that need direct, intensive, and engaged attention and then act upon that reality. And then finally, I've been asked to share some points of personal reflection. What have I learned from this journey over the last nine months? And how would I relate that to both life and to the way in which we need to think together about our future as a state? I want to thank the St. Louis Regional Chamber for giving me some of the material here because I think in the midst of all of the understanding of our problems, it is easy for the truth to be masked and easy to lose perspective in the fact that there are a number of strengths and incredible capacity in this region. And we have to step back and remind ourselves that we can leverage that capacity to do incredible things if we will just be thoughtful and targeted about the way in which we implement policy and the programs that come from those strengths. So we're here in a city in a region of icons I'm glad some of you got to go to Bush Stadium and be a part of what is going to be one of the most incredible seasons the Cardinals have ever had. And so here we sit on the way to a fifth uh, successive run in the playoffs, 11 of the last 14 years, and the team uh, virtually 40 games above 500. And as a quick side note, I would commend to you the Cardinals and their leadership as a great study 
in uh, thoughtful, engaged team building and leadership. I think, in fact, Mike Matheny's approach to learning, in fact, he said the best thing he get, garnered from Tony LaRussa was to never stop learning. And if you watch his managerial style, he is always learning and applying. And if you ask him where his greatest satisfaction comes from, it's instructive for all of us. It's not the World Series win, it's not the playoff record, it's not some incredible strategy that happened to play out. It's the success of his players. It's the people he works with that he's charged to develop. And I think therein lies a lesson for all of us. Our success lies in the people we work with and the relationships that we form. And so here in the region, we celebrate those successes and we celebrate our teams and the Clydesdales and the, the festivals and everything here. It's a diverse region, a region that has the largest concentration of Eastern European immigrants, a great project in the Mosaic Project that celebrates that diversity. And here again, I commend the Regional Chamber for making diversity and inclusion a key part of their strategic plan because it is in fact a strength. It is a strength because it brings to our region incredible knowledge, incredible talent, and an understanding of who we are as a people. Not a week goes by that I don't find a friend or an acquaintance or a friend of a friend who's come to St. Louis from somewhere around the Midwest, somewhere else around Missouri to receive world-class health care here in our community. It's one of the incredible blessings of living here. Top 10 medical schools. Uh, and programs in those medical schools, the BJC system, a world leader in many areas, and the St. Louis University Medical School and hospitals. And our capacity as a giving region, a capacity in philanthropy, is really amazing. In fact, Charity Navigator just a couple of months ago named St. Louis the first among most generous cities of the top 50. And our volunteerism rank you see on the screen an incredibly giving region, a thoughtful region about the way in which we target our dollars. And it is this strength, this capacity that gives me incredible encouragement because that capacity can be leveraged to address the realities we're gonna talk about in just a few moments. And to work here is to be part of a corporate scene. You know, a lot's been written about corporate headquarters and where they are and where they're moving to and who's losing them and who's gaining them. The truth of the matter is, in 2005, St. Louis was home to nine Fortune 500 companies. In 2015, we are home to nine Fortune 500 companies and a bunch of Fortune 1000 and Forbes, largest private growing companies in enterprise and worldwide technology, private company icons. But in 2005, those nine companies had 83 billion in revenue and in 2015, the nine that are here now have 194 billion in revenue, 132 percent increase. The region has incredible corporate strength here that drives not only our capacity for giving, but our capacity for employment and growth and innovation. And speaking of innovation, you're going to be going, many of you, to Cortex and to the CIC at 4240 this afternoon, and you're going to see innovation playing out in those two facilities. This has been uh, a strength that literally has been one of those kind of gradual growths where the flywheel starts turning and then it turns faster and faster. And now St. Louis is known as the number one place for tech job growth. T-Rex, downtown, 100,000 square feet, 100 companies, 200 entrepreneurs innovating and creating ideas in a community that has got vibrancy. In fact, if you go to CIC this afternoon at 4240 Duncan, Stop by Venture Cafe at 4 o'clock if you're there at that time. You'll see, I would guess, between 100 and 200 entrepreneurs who will get together with some of our team from the Ferguson Commission, and they're going to be talking about how do we address our reality. What ideas do you have as entrepreneurs to help our region overcome these issues and return to a positive growth trajectory in areas that are not experiencing that currently? Millennials and entrepreneurs are heavily engaged in the social issues before us today, and it's part of our ecosystem, and I commend this to you as a way to think about your strengths in your particular area. Let me step back and do a little bit of corporate uh, kind of business leadership philosophy. Most of you are familiar, I suspect, with Jim Collins' work, Good to Great. I think it's probably one of the top 20 business books written in this generation. And Collins talks about the stages of going from good to great. And in stage two, this notion of kind of disciplined thought, 
he suggests that you think about three things. And so as you think about the strategy for your region and how are you going to create growth where you are with your particular circumstances, think about these three things. What drives the economic engine of your area? What are the people and the companies and the organizations of your region most passionate about? And what can you be the best in your area, the best in the region at? What is your differentiator? And the intersection of those three, Collins called the hedgehog concept. And so it was that strategic framework that we use certainly in my corporate life at Unigroup, and many companies do. And it led us to international expansion in Asia and overseas, and it led us to creating technology platforms that revolutionized the sales process in our industry. But I would suggest to you that this drives strategy in an economic development context as well. And in fact, it is this topology that was used by our regional economic, leader, economic leaders to think about our strengths as a region and, and the four focus areas that are on the screen, some of which you'll be hearing more about at this conference. Biosciences with the largest concentration, really almost in the nation, of plant sciences scientists and a leading international effort to map the human genome. In multilodal logistics, the third largest rail hub and incredible cargo capacity in our region here in Missouri and in Illinois. A health economy that is driven by the world-class healthcare that I described earlier. And the largest concentration of financial services, talent, and companies outside of New York. And those four focus areas fit the definition of the slide just a minute ago. Economic engines, things we are passionate and capable about doing and have incredible talent, and things that we can be the best, at least uh, in, in the region, if not in the nation at. So I suggest to you as a quick side note here, as you think about promoting and learning from your strengths, this topology, this ability to think and plan together using the good to great framework may help you in your area as well. So we're going to shift gears now and move from thinking about our strengths and the capacity they represent to thinking about the challenges in our region. On August the 9th, 2014, there was an encounter between 18-year-old Michael Brown and police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson. Ferguson, as many of you know, is a middle-class community that most would say is a great example of what communities can and should be as they think about growth. But there were things in Ferguson and things in North County and things in our region that had been masked and we hadn't focused on. And that encounter generated national and international news and a focus on St. Louis and Ferguson and our region that forced us to confront our reality. And while there are hundreds of opinions about what happened on that day, August 9, 2014 did not cause problems in our region. It revealed problems that were there and that we desperately needed to focus on. Confronting reality is an incredible part of the planning going forward. And so in response to those events, Governor Nixon formed a very diverse commission of 16 people and asked us to look at these things, the underlying social and economic conditions that were limiting the region's potential to thrive. And he asked us to provide an unflinching report with transformative recommendations that would make the region in stronger and a better place for everyone in the region. And so you see the commissioners on the picture on the screen. The commissioners have 21-year-old Rasheen Aldridge, a very thoughtful, passionate, and engaged organizer who's been on the protest lines and knows and understands these issues firsthand from his own life experience. To Kevin Albren, the head of the State Fraternal Order of Police, a dedicated police sergeant in the city of St. Louis, and a very thoughtful and engaged individual about how you address these issues and ministers and lawyers and civic leaders and not-for-profit leaders and business folks in between. A bold experiment, I would suggest, in inclusive democracy to see if these, these folks from these profiles of all of us can come together and seek and find common ground. My co-chair is Reverend Starsky Wilson. And one of the reasons we committed to do this work together is because we had a relationship. We knew each other. We had been serving on the Teach for America board and working on educational equity issues. And so the ability to become partners and the ability to lead this commission came from the fact that we had a relationship and that we had done real work together before we got to this point. I think that's an instructive example. The way in which you attack these kinds of problems is you build on relationships. 
and you build on doing real work together. This was not an easy choice to make for, for either of us, and so we thought about it carefully. We both come from a common faith perspective, and so we thought about this together. We prayed about it together, and we concluded that this, in fact, was a calling that we had at this particular time in our lives and this particular time in our region. And the reason we concluded that is because we believe that the things that break God's heart, poverty, injustice, things that are just not right, people not having access to the same things that others have access to, inequities, that the things that break God's heart should break our hearts as well. And so in concluding that, we said this is a work we must do because we want to be this a place where all businesses and people thrive, where interconnections and diversity are our strength, and where empathy and respect is what drives our citizens and in being invested in their families and neighborhoods. Let me take you back to good to great for just a minute. Because I think these stages are instructive in working through issues like this just as they are in working through an economic development policy or working through a corporate strategy. The first stage is, is leadership. The first, who's on the bus? You all remember that from good to great. The second is this discipline thought process. And we're going to talk about that as I transition to my second point now about confronting our reality. How do you confront the brutal facts and leverage them into that thought process that you saw earlier. And then finally, in stage three, it's not the final stage, but it's where I'm going to leave you today. What are the disciplined actions that you take? Collins talks about a flywheel that occurs when you start to take action and it takes a turn slowly and then faster and faster as more actions build on each other. And I would suggest you're going to see it cortex and at CIC at 4220 an incredible example of the flywheel working in those particular settings, confronting the brutal facts. So now we're going to take you through a little bit of policy wonk work, so get on board here and stay with me for a few minutes because we're going to do some map work. So in confronting our reality, you have to step back and look at the underlying issues that come to the stage from circumstances like Ferguson. And you look at the geography of our county and our region, and you have to understand what's behind that. Michael Brown graduated from an unaccredited, actually non-accredited school district and struggled to graduate. He lives in an area where poverty uh, in uh, low-income families are concentrated. The, that area does not have easy access to quality health care by virtue of geography or of income. And so one of the barometers of reality is infant mortality. And so on the screen you see the disparity in both African-American infant mortality in the city and the county, and it's very close. In, 15 or 16 births resulting in death by year one of 1,000 births versus five for whites in the same region, a clear racial and health disparity. So that's our reality. I said, well, let's step back and let's take a look at the state of Missouri and look at the reality of infant deaths. And what we found is 26 counties where infant mortality was over 30%, in some cases as much as 100% above the state average, and nine counties that were exactly the same statistical circumstance as the, as the statistics I just showed you for the North County and African American region. The, the reality of health disparities is not just in our region, it is in our state, and it's something that is part of our reality. In fact, if you step back and you look on this map at folks who both lack health insurance and are at or in the range of poverty levels, you find 45 counties, 40% 40 of the counties in our state where you have over 8% of the population, almost 1 in 10 who lack insurance and are in poverty and most likely at lack access to quality health care. Access to health care is a compelling policy issue of our time. Let me take just a sidelight here and talk about Medicaid expansion. You know, virtually every business group in the state of Missouri has supported a common sense Medicaid expansion. Yet our legislature has been unable to address the issue. Governor Nixon and others have led on this, and it's not, frankly, a Republican-Democrat issue in my view. It's not a conservative-liberal issue in my view. This is a common sense economic health disparity issue. 
In my days in Jefferson City in a Republican administration, we pioneered the federal reimbursement allowance and hospital taxes that allowed us to pull down the maximum amount of federal funds. It is the same programs that now are at issue in this is expansion. And it's baffling to me why our state cannot address these health disparities in a very thoughtful way of addressing policy of expanding Medicaid. Looking at poverty in our region, if you look at these two maps, if you look at the largest map, the red area is above 20% concentration of poverty. The smaller map is a reflection of minority population. And so you see the similarity between these two maps. And this is not a map we are proud of in any way, shape, or form. It is a reflection of the fact that our region has let these issues come to a place where we uh, know we have to focus on them. We realize that they are clearly wrong in the way they play out both racially and geographically. But what about the rest of the state? And so we looked at poverty concentration around the state and we found that in this case, 26 counties find themselves uh, above the poverty level uh, that is the state average. And if you look at them, there, there are probably more that have concentrations within their county. And so of these, I think it's actually 29 counties, of these 29 counties, virtually one in five of their citizens, 20% of their citizens find themselves at or below the poverty level. Disenfranchisement, marginal populations, while they perhaps do not have a racial component, they nonetheless exist. Marginalized populations are far more prevalent than perhaps we realize around our state in the focus that we've had on our region. I asked them to just pull up, I said to an intern, look at just some areas around us, and they said, look at Wentzville and St. Clair and DeSoto, and you see those pockets of red. The map's not very clear, but the point is, even in these spaces that are suburban or uh, exurban spaces, there are concentrations of poverty, and I suspect that most of you are now, as you have scanned those maps previously, and you looked at the infant mortality map and the darker colors on that map, and you looked at the poverty map and the darker colored uh, uh, key on that map, you've realized that within your county and your area, you perhaps have more concentration of challenges than perhaps you've thought about deeply. Ferguson has caused us and forced us and compelled us to think about these issues deeply. School quality is a clear, compelling uh, component of how we have to think about our future as a state over the long term. These are high school graduation rates. And so the red areas are 8 to 20 percent uh, graduate, uh, failure to graduate rates in high schools in our region. This group is full of workforce development professionals. I don't have to tell you the importance of school quality and workforce preparation. And so what we found in this dynamic is that we have to focus on what it takes to improve our schools. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. I was not able to find a similar map for uh, the rest of the state, but I suspect most of you know the high school graduation rates of the high schools in your area. If you don't, you should. I would also suggest to you that you are in a unique position, and this would be my challenge to you in the education space, to influence the cause for reform and the cause for improvement. I think too often we found nationwide, and certainly we found this in our region, that the protection of the status quo in the education space is pretty strong and pretty heavy. And unless the business community rises up and says this kind of quality is not acceptable to us, and these test scores are ones that we must see improve in order for us to grow as a county, as a city, as a region, then it won't happen. And I think it is that compelling case that must come to the table from outside of the education world in order to drive change in a meaningful way. One thing that unites us all is the American dream. One generation doing better than the last. How do we get reach the good life for our kids better than that we had? And so we looked at economic mobility. This is more recent work. And economic mobility is defined as the ability of one generation, one family, to rise from the lowest quintile or two to the next highest quintile and then the next highest quintile. And what we found is, unfortunately, that St. Louis ranks 43rd of the top 50 metropolitan areas when you look at economic mobility. Now, we have tremendous strength, we have tremendous capacity, and everything I showed you is true, but what it has done is it's not yet impacted the marginalized populations that make this statistic true. And so I said, well, blow up the map as big as you can, and so look at Missouri in the center of this map, and the darker colors are those with the greatest challenge of economic mobility. And I think if you will scan your area of the state, 
some of you will perhaps see that you have similar challenges in mobility. Not the ability for incomes to rise, not for household incomes to go up, but for the ability of one generation to be able to move to a higher rung on the economic ladder. These realities have the potential to unite us. We all want something better for the next generation. We all realize it's wrong for the zip code where someone is born to determine their poverty level, their educational attainment, and their prospects for getting a job and having a meaningful life. Those things unite us around confronting our reality and acting. So the Ferguson Commission has become a bold experiment, as I said, an inclusive democracy. And so over the last nine months, we've had a widely diverse group of folks from all around our community process, research, and expert testimony and find themselves at 60 public meetings with over uh, 3,000 individuals attending those meetings, 100 regional leaders coming together in working groups to form around 20,000 volunteer hours, 200 recommendations or calls to action that we have boiled down to signature priorities in a very key set of areas. And so I would first of all suggest that this process has given us a model and a template and a way to proceed. And I would commend it to you. It's extensive community engagement and we'd be happy to share what we've learned from that. So as I wind up on this taking action point before I share some personal reflections and wrap up, let me suggest that there is hope in action. And we have found that through some early action and some early victories that we've been able to say to folks, you know what, we can deal with these issues. Some of them are long term, some of them are frankly generational. But in the generational components of our work, there is the reality of we know, in many cases, what works. So our path toward racial equity, which will be the title of our report, which will be released in mid-September, are three components, three buckets of our calls to action, three priorities, justice for all, youth at the center, and the opportunity to thrive. And so we focused on police reform and police training and finding ways to support our officers with new tools and help them understand how to deal with widely diverse communities. And Governor Nixon uh, endorsed a training proposal just a few weeks ago and asked the, the Police Officer Standards Training Board to move it forward. The legislature responded with Senate Bill 5 to work on municipal court reform and municipal consolidation, a bill that gave us a good foundation, a good first step around which to build a clear inequity. The zip code in which I live should not determine whether getting a speeding ticket or being pulled over for having a tail light out is a career limiting move. And in some parts of our region, that's true. In my part of the region, it means I go to the traffic law center and lay down my $250 and get it dealt with, right? Police reform, police training, court reform, the ability to work with a community and to develop rules, and, and I would say the law enforcement community in this region has come forward. They've, they've stepped to the table and they said, we know we do some things well and we know we need to improve and let's talk about it. And so this working group made up of activists and law enforcement leaders and people as divergent as the ACLU uh, and the police union came together on a set of recommendations and found common ground. Our youth at the center work focused on early childhood education and some innovative programs that are already in place but have not scaled and focusing on how we get health care to the youngest and most vulnerable of our population and reform our education and infrastructure. The beauty of this one is we know what works. We know great school leaders, great teachers supported by a governance structure and a, and a district and school culture that supports them makes a huge difference and where those aren't present Educational quality suffers. Where they are present, extraordinary things happen. How do we scale that? How do we put that in more school districts? How do you put that in your school districts? Driving from the business and job training and workforce development area. And then finally, we focused on the opportunity to thrive. A couple of points got cut off here about financial security and building assets. There's an incredible amount of work to be done to help those that are in poverty build assets gradually. And there's some great model programs that the Fed has helped us develop here that we can pioneer and pilot in North County. Some of the work that Steve Stengers talked about earlier is a great example here. I would suggest to you that those of you that are in job training and workforce development areas, help us here statewide. Help us here if you're in our region. We found that the metrics of what really works in this spa space are not as robust and not as good as they ought to be. And we found programs that are limited in scope, 
that frankly aren't producing the results. And we found programs that are broad and expansive that have gotten into a routine of churning out graduates but not churning out folks that are qualified for living wage jobs. How do we deal with that collectively? These are statewide issues that are impacting our region and they may be impacting yours as well. One other thing in this space and then I'll, I'll move to my final area. That is uh, related to trial development accounts or the 529 program that you're familiar with. Sally and others have helped us think about this in a much broader way. And we found states that have statewide developed programs to put a small amount of money, sometimes as small as $50, sometimes as large as $500 away for every child in a school district, in a state, in a particular school. And what it does, amazingly enough, my friends, is it sets an expectation from early on that that child will succeed, that that child will do something after high school, possibly college. And parents and others can help contribute to that and grow it, but if someone starts it and the child and the parents know and the significant folks in that child's life know that that's there, it changes outcomes. The longitudinal study in the state of Oklahoma on their statewide program suggests that there's real opportunity here for Missouri and you're going to be hearing more about that. Justice for all, youth at the center, an opportunity to thrive, a path toward racial equity. This journey for our region, uh, for me personally, has been a compelling, re a compelling journey. It's compelling and convicting all at once. I'm instructed by the scriptural admonition here that to those to whom much is given, much is expected. Actually, I'm told the more correct translation is much is required. To those to whom given, much is given, much is required. And this hit home to me when I went back and looked at a blog I had written when I was on an overseas trip and on the way home, I wrote something about that trip. Sharon and I are deeply involved in a faith-based microfinance bank called Opportunity International. It's the largest and, and oldest bank of its kind and works in 22 developing countries. And so we were on the way back from Kenya and I wrote in my blog at the time I was 54 that if I had been born in Kenya, on average, I would not be alive. The life expectancy was such that 54-year-old men were the anomaly. And that one of our two children would likely not have made it to age five. And that was compelling to me. That yet by the providence of my birth, in the place I was born, that could very well have been my circumstance. And so now fast forward to 2015, and one of the things we've learned about our region, and you may want to learn about yours, is that if I had been born just five miles from here in 63106 in North City, that my life expectancy would be 18 years shorter than where I currently live. And in fact, now at age 61, I would have just seven more years of life expectancy had I been born in that zip code to those to whom much is given, much is required. I've learned how little I know and how learning statistics like the one I just gave you should compel us all to act and say that's just not right, that the accident of birth in a particular zip code should not determine your educational outcome. It should not determine your job readiness. It should not determine your health. It should not determine your life expectancy. We're better than that. And the capacity that I showed in our region and the capacity that's in your region, I think, reflects the fact that we all can be better than that on the challenges that we have in our region. And here's the payoff of that slide. The payoff is this. In every part of our state, in every part of our communities, there are disenfranchised populations. There are people that are marginalized. There are folks that have been ignored. And there are perhaps trends and dynamics like those I've described in our region that you will find to be true in your region. And you will find that they are, if not an economic hindrance, they certainly should compel a moral imagination that spurs us all to action. And it's not conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat. It's what's right. And it's what should compel us to act. And so the great work of this journey has been to find that common ground to find places where we can come around people and relationships and doing real work. And so let me close with just two very quick stories. One is about my friend Drew, who eight years ago partnered 
with a church in North City and formed a company called Jubilee Services. Jubilee Services provides direct hands-on mentoring and training in contracting and lawn work to give folks that have had difficulty, perhaps with a record or perhaps poor training, difficult life experiences, a way and a path out of poverty. And it's an intensive program that involves a mentor from the company and a mentor from a church and intensive wraparound services to say, we're going to be with you through this and we're going to help you be able to get out of your circumstance. Real people forming real relationships to do real work. We had a youth summit at the Ferguson Commission. And we invited only young people under age 24 to come to see us on a Saturday morning at Florissant Valley Community College. And we listened for hours to 150 as they got up and talked about their experiences. And in the middle of that um, great, um, I, I would say, expression of hope, for the future that came from those young people. A gentleman came to the podium, he had a hood on, and he, could, uh, he came up and he took his hood off and it was clear he was over 24. And he said, I know, I'm not supposed to be here. He said, but I have to come tell you this story, please let me speak. And so he told us his story. He said, I live in Canfield Greens where Michael Brown lived. He said, I found that my high school experience was far less than one that would prepare me. He said, we didn't have books. Our teachers were not motivated. It was just not a great experience. And he said, so I came out of that without a lot of hope and without a lot of opportunity. And he said, I'm committed to stay in Canfield. I'm committed to stay it, to make it better, but I'm going to be limited in what I can do by virtue of my educational background. And then he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a photograph. And it was a photograph of his one-year-old son, and he said, I want you to look at this picture. And he handed it to the first commissioner, and we passed it down the road, and we all looked at his one-year-old son, and he said, I want for him a better life. I don't want him to have the same educational experience that I had. I want him to have the chance for a good job. I want him to grow up healthy. And that's why what you're doing is so important. He said, I'll make it. I'm committed. I'll work hard. But for him... He was born here in Canfield. He has to have a better future. And I would suggest to you that's what compels us all. Building a better future by promoting and learning from our strengths, confronting our reality and acting on it, and then realizing that the privilege that we have been given, the grace that we have been shown by virtue of where we are born and the success and opportunity and resources we have compels us to do that much is required. Thanks for letting me be with you this morning. God bless you.